All right, everyone, it's about 11.15, uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I thought a few people were about to walk in, but they turned around and walked right back out, so <laughs> looks like y'all are it. Um, this session is going to be uh, about open stack testing, so uh, the, the focus that we've had on mainly trying to get Tempest to execute and uh, rally, and then we're also going to start out by talking about the third-party CI effort that uh, we're beginning. And pretty much just went over the agenda. So again, we're going to start out talking about third-party CI, and then uh, that's the part that I'll be uh, discussing, and then Andrew is going to talk about Rally and Tempest. So for the third-party CI, uh, at, at the last Connect, we were we had several discussions about Tempest and how we were going to try and execute it within Lenaro and report test results, and those discussions kind of morphed into, well, what's, what's the, what do we really need to be doing? What's, what's the goal of doing this? Um, and after uh, having some discussions with people and, and reading some things, we decided that what we really want to do is not just execute Tempest for the sake of executing it within Lenaro, but uh, do it in such a way that we can get the ARM64 architecture supported as a as a real platform for OpenStack, which if any of you are familiar with OpenStack, it's very x86 oriented, right? So uh, in order to get ARM treated as a first class supported architecture in OpenStack, it's, we have to demonstrate that it's, it's stable and that it can pass the uh, Tempest test suite that they use for CI. So instead of just executing Tempest within Lenaro and reporting results on a, on a limited scale to anyone that happens to go look, what we decided we really needed to do was execute it as part of OpenStack CI system and first of all push results out so that they're visible for everyone to see that wants to look, but then once we demonstrate that we're stable, actually comment on uh, commits within Garrett and get to the point that we can, we can gate the commits based on whether things execute on ARM properly or not. So what is this CI system and what is it not going to be? So what it is is going to be Tempest running against OpenStack triggered by Garrett events from OpenStack Garrett. We'll report the results back to their Garrett system and it's, it's a functional test of OpenStack components. What it's not is going to be a general purpose ARM64 test environment. So we're not going to test KVM explicitly. We're not going to test anything, any of these other dependencies of OpenStack explicitly. They're going to get tested as part of running the OpenStack tests. But it's not going to be a general purpose test environment like Lava is with all of the boards that they've got in the, in the lab. It's strictly to run the OpenStack CI system. Uh, we're not, like I said, we're not going to test the hypervisor functionality. So there's plenty of other tests that's being, that are being run against KVM to verify it works properly. We will be using KVM as part of this test system, but we're not going to be explicitly testing it. And it will not test the performance or functionality of the VMs that will be started as part of the tests. Uh, we will have to boot VMs to verify that OpenStack's working properly, but whatever happens in the VM, we, we really won't care. So how are we going to do this? Well, first of all, we're going to use pre-existing OpenStack CI components. We're going to try as, as, little, as much as possible to limit any custom work that we have to do. Uh, they've already got a lot of components that work properly on x86. Uh, they've been very heavily tested, and we want to leverage that as much as we can. Uh, part of setting up that test infrastructure is going to be uh, uh, require setting up an OpenStack deployment and we're going to use that with uh, KVM hypervisor. At some point maybe we can get to the point of using a Zen hypervisor as well to exercise that, but we're starting out with KVM. And it will run the uh, DevStack and Tempest Suite configured to use KV, uh, QEMU instances. So within the uh, KVM guests that we'll test in, all the other work will be run using just QEMU. This is a, a diagram that I found that's kind of a high level overview of all of the components that make up an OpenStack CI system. Uh, this is one for an x86 deployment 
and that is essentially what we're going to create with the uh, exception of the CI cloud. All the VMs that we're going to use are going to be running on ARM64 nodes. So kind of the, the, a little bit of the, the discussion that came out during the keynote this morning of, uh, of a hybrid type environment where you've got x86 and ARM working together, this CI system is going to run partially on x86 and partially on ARM. We're going to leverage all the existing CI components and the fact that they have been tested fully on x86. We're going to run those on x86 because there's no need for us to test those components on ARM. That's not what we're testing. We want to test whether OpenStack works. So we will use all of the other components on x86 and then just use ARM64 nodes for actually uh, running the tests. Um, as far as how we're going to set it up, uh, we're going to set up a dedicated environment in the uh, Lenaro Colo facility in Austin. Initially, it's going to be set up using an HP Moonshot because that's the hardware we have. Um, we're going to use a single chassis and start out with about uh, five M300 cartridges. So those are HP's uh, AMD 64 cartridge. And then start out with about 20 M400s, which are the McDivitts that uh, I brought at the last Connect to show. And they're eight core ARM64. And so those are actually going to run all the tests. So the plans as far as scaling this thing up, we can't, we can't initially handle the amount of commits that come through OpenStack on a daily basis. So we're going to limit it initially to just running against uh, commits to Nova. And then over time, scale to handle some of these other projects and eventually get to where we're, hopefully, if we have the, the hardware to handle it, running against all the commits that come in. So does anyone have any questions for me before I get to a couple of my questions? All right. Um, one of the open questions that I've had is, what other projects do we need to test? Um, we're just going to be testing, or j we're just going to be running Tempest as a, as a generic test of OpenStack functionality. But as, you know, the question is, is any other members or any other groups within Lenaro have any specific OpenStack plugins, uh, you know, network related, storage related that could benefit from having tests run at the same time as all these others and have results fed back to OpenStack. Uh, nothing? All right. Um, I'm sorry? Okay. So the other big question I had, does anyone want to help? Um, Andrew is going to talk about uh, our efforts with Tempest in just a few minutes. Uh, there are still quite a few failures that we're seeing that uh, need help being debugged. And then the second question, anyone have any experience setting up a third-party OpenStack CI system? Uh, Finding help and finding people that have done it, there's not that many people that have a lot of expertise in it. Uh, if anyone in Lenaro, a member company or, or anyone otherwise, has any help or, or any knowledge of how to set one of these things up, we'd appreciate any help. How well defined, how well defined is the work or the help that you need? Like um, items that need fixing, do we have a good list of those somewhere? So if we were to try and find additional resources, how could we approach them and say, here's actually what we need? So if you guys got that well documented, whether it's you know, inside Lenaro or outside. But so right now we've started a um, bugzilla within Lenaro for capturing the OpenStack third party, sorry, the Tempest tests which are failing. Um, so we can look at those. Um, in the runs that I see, they're typically pretty much the same um, failures. So it's quite easy to actually dig in f from a lava result and actually find that list. Is it easy for us to find? Is it linked? Yeah, I've got a slide at the end of this, which, will, which has got a link to the Bugzilla page. Okay. Cool. Hi, uh, Bob Monkman from the LNG group from ARM. Uh, I wanted to mention that the OpenNFV project, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the OpenNFV.org uh, initiative, 
they're um, putting together uh, NFV stacks, including OpenStack, uh, and putting together their own CI infrastructure. And, you know, putting together OpenStack and Open Daylight and KVM and you know, the whole the whole NFV stack. And so they are very much right now in the thick of putting together all of the CI infrastructure. And it's an open open project, so you can go to get on the list, you can go connect with people on the wiki, and um, that might be a good resource to try and see how they're, they're outside of OpenStack, but putting all these building blocks together might be a good resource to see how they're doing it. Uh, connect with me, and I'll, I'll I'll put you in touch with some people who are are working on that. Okay. Yeah, great. Does anyone have any other questions before we move on? All right. Okay. So I want to switch a little bit now to talk about Rally. Um, and you know, one of the first questions is, you know, what is Rally? And Rally itself is an OpenStack project, and it's there to help measure performance and validation of the workloads. So you run a benchmark, um, and the goal of it is to explain how the deployment scales. And this is quite different from Tempest testing, where Tempest looks at one particular part of, say, the Nova API. If you run these benchmarks, it also captures the results and provides um, a database so you can get an historical view of those results and you can see how you're trending over time. And, and when you look at an individual result, you can see um, details in terms of some statistic, statistical numbers in terms of how fast that benchmark was running. And although you are running a benchmark, it's also important that the benchmark completes successfully. I mean, you could boot and delete a VM, but you also need to validate that when you booted that VM, it could actually do something useful. So we talked about Tempest quite a bit, and we've been running Tempest for quite some time. And you know, one of the questions is, you know, what is the, diff what is the core difference between Rally and Tempest? And if you look here, we can, Rally is really a much higher level tool than what Tempest currently provides. So with Tempest, you're typically running against um, a, a single node, it's a gating API, whereas with Rally, you want to actually see how your data center handles load. And you're talking about running tests which target multiple machines, thousands of users, um, which is very different to what Tempest does. And one of the key features for each um, Rally benchmark that you run is workload. And there is a note here that we could actually use Tempest itself as a workload if we wanted to. So one of the problems we have is we want to find some real world um, workloads to run. Um, and one idea right now is to actually use um, Tempest itself. But I think you know, it would be better if we could find some other ones. So there is, if you look at um, the Rally documentation, there is typically three high level use cases for using Rally. Um, there's Rally for DevOps. So you have an existing cloud, you want to simulate some real world, um, real world load aggregate those results and verify, verify that some service level agreement is being met or is still being met. Um, for developers in QA, it's kind of a little bit different in that for developers, you've got a, um, something on your desk and you probably don't have access to you know, hundreds and hundreds of um, nodes, but you may have access to 10 or 20 and you can use Rally in that kind of environment. But the one that we've been trying to focus on is for continuous integration and for continuous delivery. Um, so in this mode, you have a specific hardware configuration, and you understand which version of, temp uh, sorry, which version of OpenStack you're trying to test. So, for example, in the lab, I know that I've deployed um, OpenStack IceHouse. Um, I know the exact configuration of the hardware, and I want to run some some benchmarks against that and just val and validate that a they, they complete, and then we can look at the numbers, um, and and. When we talk about Icehouse and Juno releases, these are for gathering um, baselines because ongoing, we want to also do those tests against TIP to see whether TIP is getting better or worse. So I'm probably going to skip over the next couple of slides because 
they're quite wordy and we've got an example which may um, explain this a little bit better. But they're here that, you know, if you wanted to go over the slides afterwards, you could understand maybe in a bit more detail what, part, what each part of Rally does. So in this example here, we can see it's just a text file. Um, this is one I made up for booting um, a VM and deleting a VM. If we look through from the top, we can see we have chosen a particular flavor. So we know the size that each VM is going to be configured as. We know what image we're going to use, whether that's just like a Cirrus image or something a little bit bigger like a server image. Um, and then we have this runner. And in Rally, there is a concept of, you know, how do you want to run this? And here we want to, act, um, here we want to exert a constant load on the server. So we want to run boot and delete um, forever, if you like, and see how it behaves. But there is some time out with that. I mean, we, we could run forever, but we, in this particular case, we can say we're going to run 15 times, and then we can look at the results. But, you know, you could run 1,000 times. There are different types of runners. Um, there is a constant which will run for a duration. So if you didn't want to run like a stress test, you could run it, say, for an hour, and then just um, accumulate the results. There is another style of runner, which is periodic. And once it's done, a, say, a boot and delete, there is a grace period before it starts the next one. So maybe you want to do some cleanup, or you want to gather results, maybe you want to look at them before you start again. And the other part of the, um, the equation, if you like, is when I'm running this benchmark, how many users and how many tenants do I want to basically try and um, exert pressure on that, that system? It's not listed here, but when you choose, um, you can also choose kind of the CPU size, the RAM, and the disk that is available to that VM. I mean, some of that comes through the flavor ID as well. So when you run one of these benchmarks, um, everything, all the results are stored in a database, um, which is great for if you want to do some data mining and trend analysis. Um, if you look at the example here, I've cut the, um, the output from this rally task list down a little bit so it fits on the screen. Um, there is a column which you can, where you can tag a result, and that is a freeform tag. So you can go back um, and make queries against the runs that you've previously done with some tags that you've added. Instances versus users per tenant and concurrency. How many of those relate to nodes versus guests versus maybe users per guest in that scenario there? So in this case, um, so we have 20 instances which are going to run, and against each one of those instances, there's just going to be one tenant. And an instance in this case is a core or a KVM guest? It's a guest. Instance. Okay. Yeah. And were those 20 instances all running on one physical machine in this case? It, I mean, if, you, if you're OpenStack cluster, I mean, you're, you're going to be subject to the scheduling of Nova. So if you have 10 nodes, then the Nova scheduler will probably round robin across those. OK, and in your case, what were you targeting? One node? So I, I've got some results, and they show using three nodes and four nodes. OK. Good. OK, I'm just trying to get a picture of how many guests per SOC or per core or per system in right. the testing we've done thus far. Okay. So, I mean, I think in, in essence it's against the VM as opposed to per core. Yeah. So, I, I spent some time running just boot and delete. Um, I have a local setup where I have one controller and two compute nodes, and in the, in the Austin Colo, I begged for a few more machines and got one more, so I did some against uh, three compute nodes. And really, there's just a disclaimer here. In the testing I've done, it's you know, kind of really exemplary because the network is shared um, and some of the boxes are shared, so I don't know what else is going on on that network. The links here um, will take you off to the actual results, which are, at, which are dynamic. They're HTML results. Um, I've, I've put one in the slides here. So you see you get these, um, I guess, pretty pictures from the Rally output tool. And it shows you some statistics, the min, the max, and the average of booting and deleting.
I can go through some of these offline with people if they want to, uh, because the problem with it here in the slide is not dynamic, it's just a screenshot. Um, but if anybody wants to have a look afterwards, I can go through that. So within Lunaro, I mean, how are we running Rally right now? And the goal is to do um, all of this through Lava. Um, I've been doing a lot of it manually at the moment, um, just to kind of get a, an understanding of Rally and how we can use it. But I think now that we're in a situation where we can actually do some automation with that. Our initial goal is to start with Nova. Um, and then as, as, as we grow, we can look at some of the other OpenStack components. And then in the future, I think somebody mentioned about um, NFE. Perhaps we can actually use Rally to do some benchmarking of um, ODP and NFE in general. And I guess one key point, I've, I mean, I've been using um, TIP most of the time. But because TIP moves so fast, it's very difficult to understand from one day to the next what is actually going on. So I think it's important that we go back and actually run these scenarios against stable releases, which gives us a baseline. And then we can understand you know, where is OpenStack going um, on TIP compared to where it was, say, six months ago. So that's kind of uh, an update on Rally and how we plan to use it. Um, I can break here if there's any questions for Rally. So within the OpenStack development community, is there any, um, any process such that the community monitors Rally or Tempest to evaluate updates? I mean, you said it's moving so quickly. Um, is there any, are there any checkpoints in place for that, or is it? So th there, there are happen? with Tempest, because, I mean, it's basically a gating system. So for every commit which goes into OpenStack, Tempest is run. And the, you know, the commit is not merged unless Tempest is clean. I haven't seen some, something on the same side for Rally. I don't know who's running um, performance benchmarks. In the open, that is. Any more for Rally? Okay, if we, so if we switch um, a little bit back to Tempest again. Um, so over the next few slides, I just want a quick update um, from a, a slide which was presented to the steering committee by Clark in December, I think. Um, an, an analysis of the results that we see, the current issues that I see, at least with um, running Tempest, and what we plan to do in the next cycle and how we plan to fix some of the, um, the issues that we see. So this is an output um, from a lava job which was run, which was um, run against Icehouse. Um, as you can see here, we have you know, 1,379 passes. So if you look at the ratio between that and fail right now, it's pretty good. I think we're in good shape. If you look at some of those test failures, um, some of them are related to timeouts, but there's also a large number of skips, and we need to look at that. So if we, if we try and understand why there are so many skips, I mean, just going back to this slide, there is 322 versus 200 on x86. So it's not like x86 is clean right now. I mean, there are the same kind of issues on x86. And the question is, you know, what are they? And there is a little bit of a discrepancy here between what we see on ARM on x86. If we dig a little bit deeper into these, I mean, the, some of the reasons why you skip results is because there is component is simply just not installed. And that's true for x86 as well. So if you, if you run an OpenStack um, and then you run the Tempest test suite against it, if you take the minimal configuration, there will be some subcomponents of OpenStack which are just simply not configured. So on the, even on the x86 side, you see 200 skips. We don't have these, um, the live migration right now, so that, that is another reason why we see a number of skips in the output. When you're running Tempest, quite often you see um, test skipped because there is a known bug against it, and that is true on x86 as well. And for our own local setup, I discovered um, two configuration errors which were preventing some of the tests from running. Uh, so one thing we're, we're going to try and do 
um, next is use the sample configuration file that they use on x86 for running Tempest tests and just add the bits for ARM to the end of that. And there are not too many differences. Um, a lot of it is obviously we need a different image and there are some minor um, additions to that in terms of how the flags that we need for, for KVM to boot that image. If we'd, if we'd shared the configuration, I think, in the first place, I think we'd have picked up these two configuration errors before. Um, so this has kind of just been a little bit of an audit for us. Thank you. you guys have a couple of cards uh, in the system, the cookbooks for tracking, and there's kind of a table of functionality. Uh, is the information being updated from this? So there you've got components not installed, but there's an et cetera at the end. So what about you have the very specific granularity on the components that aren't installed. So we went through that card, I think, a few weeks ago. I mean, it breaks out all the individual components. So there's quite a long list. Yep. Yeah, and we updated that a few weeks ago with the ones that we've tested. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and then the config setting not enabled there. Is suspend, in that case, suspending a VM or suspending of the platform, as in power management? The VM. Okay. okay. And is it live migration or just guest migration that's missing? I thought we had guest migration full stop was being worked on and then live migration as a more advanced follow -up. So my understanding that was both were coming later. Okay. I think that's my understanding too, but uh, the guest migration I think is due soon, right? As in March, maybe, if I remember correctly. Uh, live migration, I don't know. Do we have a card specific to that right now? And we can check. I, don't, I, I just I know guest migration, but not live migration. Okay. Yeah, I don't have the card. I don't have the number on me, but I thought. Okay. Yeah. And, and the reason I'm asking is back to your previous comment about trying to get help. People that may be familiar with the CI loop or helping you debug the things. I think one of the challenges I have right now is understanding what does and doesn't work in enough detail to be able to seek additional help to fix things or, or yep. you know allocate things to people. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to make sure that we're doing a really good job of collecting that and being as explicit as we can on that information and then you know, I'm sure Larry will kind of be keeping a close eye on that, so will yeah. I and others. So I, I'm, I'm kind of acutely aware of that and there's a couple of slides which are going to come on to which could explain you know, what we do better going forward. Yeah. Just a question on clarification too, when we talk about not installed, how many of those are because they don't work or just were chosen not to be installed? Sorry, I didn't get the beginning of the question. So, like, you've got skips because components not installed. Right. So, Cinder is an example. Is that because you just didn't have it installed, or is that because there's a blocker and we know it doesn't work? I, I think there's a bit of both. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and I think that's one one level of clarification that would really help. Okay. In in kind of building on Jeff's point of, you know, if if there's, for example, packages that aren't available and I can't build and cinder and get it going, understanding that versus, hey, we just don't have it. Right. Uh, or That's the clarity that would really help. So using cinder as an example, so the reason we disabled that was because we don't have the ability to hot plug a volume into an instance. So that's the PCI Express support that is missing from uh, KVM and QMU. So we didn't even bother installing it. Otherwise, cinder appears to work. It just serves no purpose at the moment. Uh, some of these others, uh, Zakar, I never even heard of that one, but there are tests uh, in Tempest that will run against it. We have never tried installing it uh, until I saw the tests that didn't run against it. I didn't even know it existed. So there's, there's several components out there we haven't even tried. Um, Sahara, Salometer, we haven't even tried installing them uh, to run. So I don't know whether they work or don't work, but they're not a default component that would be installed. Thanks. And, and just a comment on the, um, Clark's word of the, of the uh, default. So I've been, I've been struggling to find the differences between x86, I mean, given that there's 322 versus 200, which is why I want to go back and actually make our configuration like x86, but in the places where we need to be ARM specific, only just do that. And I think there's a little bit of a discrepancy in what we have for the configuration right now. And I think once we have that, then maybe it's easier to understand what is the genuine difference between ARM and x86 right now. 
And I guess by default we mean, so we're using DevStack to deploy this because that's, that's what Tempest would use, or, or that's what the OpenStack CI uses to deploy when they run Tempest. So it's the defaults that are built into the configurations for DevStack. So, I mean, we also have like 36 failures in that example run. Um, I see sometimes typically seven is quite common. And you, you then begin to say, okay, so why is there a discrepancy between seven and 36? Where does that come from? And if you look in, you, you actually see some HTTP timeouts in some of the service requests. Um, from one run to the next, it's actually quite difficult to understand why that is, but then you're running on a shared network, so um, maybe that is a, a poor explanation, perhaps, but it's, it's difficult to understand from if you run Tempest in the morning for a few hours and then you run it in the afternoon, why does some of the runs result in a HTTP timeout? Um, given the importance, you know, we care greatly about figuring out this OpenStack stuff, um, there's HP hardware on the way, I guess, at some point that will give you enough of a system to, to do this in isolation, but why don't we carve out some number of the developer cloud systems on a discrete network for these guys at this point to help them progress this and remove the uh, network fluctuations, does that make sense? And, and we could take it offline, we got the Lega SQL uh, meetings later, but yeah, a dedicated number of the systems, right? So he's, he's on a shared system right now, so he's got these HTTP timeout issues that may or may not be uh, related to noise on the system because it's shared. Well, let's eliminate that, that piece yep. from the equation, right, and carve out five machines on their own network or whatever and, and give you access to them for the duration until the HP system shows up or whatever, right? I don't know. We can Does chat about it in the legacy meetings later on, but it seems like a fairly easy one to fix. Right. And it's also, I mean, I can use the word noise because, you know, if it is just a transient failure, I don't want to spend so much time looking at it. I want to just get to the real failures, you yeah. um, So I, I, I also did spend quite some time looking at the ARM failures and, you know, I was kind of bashing my head against the wall a little bit. So I, I would periodically go and run um, DevStack on x86, just, but just using a virtual machine on my desktop. And more often than not, I would actually get zero failures. So I was like, okay, so maybe this is a genuine ARM issue. Um, but the more times I ran on x86, I could actually reproduce some of the problems I was seeing on ARM. So I think some of these things that we see here are not just ARM related. If I run Tempest um, as a, in a while one loop on x86, 95% of them pass with zero failures. But I do run into some of the same issues that I see on ARM. So I don't think this is um, clean cut in that when you run on x86, there are zero failures all the time. I don't think that's true. I mean, it's just a kind of anecdotal observation based on running now a little bit harder on, KV on x86. And th there is a, there's a couple of examples here. Um, they both link to bugs which are in Launchpad for OpenStack. Um, this one which says, uh, unable to establish SSH connection. If you go and look at the Launchpad bug, I mean, it's been open, closed, open, closed, open, closed. So I don't think the root cause has actually been found there. And I see that sometimes on, on the runs that I do. Um, and then there is another one here where if I run Tempest and I see the failures and then I run it again and I run it again, I get into a situation where Tempest hangs. And actually, if you go on x86 and do that same thing, it also hangs there as well. But I think the way that they run Tempest in the third-party CI is that they boot up a VM, they run the test suite, they record the results, and they tear it all down again. Whereas actually, if you leave it up and you run it as more of a stress test, you run into some of the same issues. And the only reason I see these issues is because I'm trying to debug the Tempest failures. So I'm not actually tearing the machine down. I'm actually going back and rerunning it. And this is when I was running into these issues. And it was only actually going back and trying this, the same kind of behavior on x86 that you actually see it there as well. Are you following up with the bug in Launchpad that exists? Or are we opening cards for things that we need to investigate inside of Lenaro? Or 
So on the internal OpenStack Bugzilla that we now have, I've been recording these as ARM, well, I, I did record it as an ARMv8 failure because I thought it was, but it's only within the last couple of weeks that I've realized that's probably not true. Okay. And there is, in the, in the bug that I raised, there is actually a link to the Launchpad um, okay. ID. Excellent. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're capturing these things, right? Because we've got to yeah. go knock them out, so log everything, and then we can figure out how to deal with it, I yep. think is the, the key. Okay, great. So how do we get more test passing? Um, we can enable more s subsystems when they're available. We get live migration working, and then we can see here live migration is planned for um, later, in, um, well, next month, actually. And also, if you look at the Tempest um, output as it's running, there are lots of tests related to Neutron, and we need to see how we can get Neutron configured and working on ARMv8. No, not at the moment. We haven't looked at it. I mean, one of the concerns I would have with Neutron right now is how we actually set it up in the lab for running the tests, because I don't believe it supports the flat DHCP model, so you may need multiple NICs on the board. And in, so on the Mustangs that we're using at the moment, multiple NICs are not supported. So I believe there is work um, from APM to get those drivers upstreamed into the kernel. And the Moonshot hardware that we're about to get two NICs do work, so this is something we could you know, proceed with once we get, the, once we get that hardware. But, uh, last ship update I got, it's supposed to arrive while I'm here, so hopefully it'll be white normally when I get back. So if you, if you look at the way I've been running Tempest um, over the last few months is I have three boards and I, I set those up um, as Lava jobs. And if you look at the way we do the deployment of that is we boot um, an initial um, image over NFS. We take a Ubuntu cloud image. We download that. We DD it onto the disk. We reboot that machine. We then do the dev stack installation and run Tempest. And that is about a two to three hour procedure. And the frustrating thing is if you get some scripting wrong at the end of it, it, it can kill your day. <laughs> um, so the plan is we're gonna now have three dedicated machines in Lava for OpenStack testing. And so this comes back to maybe we can even use a separate network switch to isolate some of the HTTP timeouts that we're seeing. And the goal here is basically to improve the test execution time. So with these machines, and, and, and in particular for the rally benchmarking that we want to do, there will be no reboot. Um, so the machines will always be up, and th there will be an OpenStack deployed on that. And in Lava, we will use dummy SSH jobs to actually run the rally performance benchmarks. And honestly, I would expect that to take our, some of our testing time down from two hours to minutes. So once that's in place, I think then we can start looking at establishing baselines for some of the previous releases and then for TIP so that we have those as reference points. And there is a nod here to basically say that we're also going to do this on x86. But you know, this is going to be a best effort. We're going to use KVM. We just want a, a kind of a ballpark figure. We're not going to try and replicate any of the third-party CI testing that already takes place on x86. One of the one of my goals there is to basically say that the way that we install and use and configure DevStack in a Lava job, how different is that from ARM to x86? And yeah, we may discover that there are some differences. So if we, if we run these jobs on x86, at least we're kind of talking about the same environment when we're actually collecting the results. And I mean, I have I, had at some um, lab issues with the boards that are there right now. So there are four Mustangs, um, they're shared. So if I, if I submit a multi-node job, which basically says I want two OpenStack nodes, it may not run for a few hours until those boards are available. And this is another reason why we want to have those, those three new boards purely as dedicated OpenStack nodes. So I spoke to the Lava team yesterday and they're gonna set that up for us next week. And 
only Clark and I were basically able to submit jobs against those boards. And, and another cas casual observation is you know, sometimes when I do submit jobs in, in the Lava Lab, um, those jobs fail very early. I mean, it, you get like 73 runs and it, and it stops. So there is some ongoing investigation to do there. So as I mentioned, we started this um, Bugzilla um, component and we're basically going to raise ARM V8 bugs that we see there right now. Anything else which we which we believe is common, we're going to you know continue to use the the upstream bugs which are, have already been reported or report report as new. So that's pretty much what I had for Tempest and Rally. Any questions on the Tempest side? Was watching. <laughs> Any other questions at all? So, are we getting plugged into the OpenStack community more as a result of this, or are you guys pretty much off on your own relative to this work? Because there's sort of an outreach of getting that community understanding what, what you guys are doing here yep. as well, right? So I, I would expect that to come more and more as we do the third-party CI testing, because we want to get into a position where they feel confident enough that we can then report and comment on bugs into the, you know, into the ups, OpenStack upstream third-party gating system. Um, I think also the flip side to that is I've, I've seen what I think are kind of basically local issues with Lava deployments and stuff like that, which really obviously doesn't affect, you know, there's no relation between that and the upstream OpenStack community. And as part of the investigation for doing this third-party CI, I've, been, I've started talking to a lot of the guys in the OpenStack infrastructure team uh, out on IRC. I haven't met any of them, met it, met any of them in person. I'm planning to go to the uh, developer summit uh, this summer and actually get some more conversations with them. But uh, basically, the infrastructure team is about all I've started talking with. Not currently, because we weren't sure how far we were going to be. Uh, with, with hardware delays, uh, I'm not sure what point we'll be by May. It would be nice to be able to go there and say, OK, look, we've got this CI running on ARM now. Here's the results that we're getting. But don't want to don't want to go there and look like a failure <laughs> anyway, uh, Clark is in touch with the key tempest uh, maintainers uh, Andrew met them at the OpenStack summit in Paris last November so we thanks to HP we started uh, initiating these contacts and the agreement with I think with Matthew was that until we we start seeing regular results from Tempest on the commits that that, that the the OpenStack project is getting, going back to uh, to the Tempest maintainers would be too early. So once we start getting these results on a regular basis, we can we can then engage more. Right now, it's 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 homework that needs to be completed on our side. I, I did have an interesting conversation with the um, from a guy who is doing pretty much what we're trying to do, but on Power 8. Um, and I was discussing with him um, the number of passes and failures that they see. And it seems like we're roughly in the same ballpark, um, which I, was kind of curious for me. <laughs> I mean, I was talking about I was seeing like 899 passes very typically all the time with no issues. And he said, yeah, that's pretty much what I see too. Um, and then they're, they're also digging into some of the Tempest failures that they see. So you know, maybe we should inter interact with the, those guys a little bit more as well, because maybe the, you know, it's different to x86 and understanding why. I mean, maybe they've already fixed some of those issues.